Hello, I'm Susan Page, the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. Thanks to everyone in our digital audience for joining us today here in Washington, across the country, and around the world. And our thanks to Brookings for sponsoring this conversation. It is my honor to talk today with Daryl West about his ambitious and alarming new book. It's called Power Politics, Trump and the Assault on American Democracy. He is a familiar voice on these issues. He has authored or co-authored almost two dozen books. Some of them have won top awards in their fields. They're on topics that range from robots to billionaires, so quite a range there. Daryl was a professor of political science at Brown University from 1982 to 2008, then moved to Brookings in 2008 as the head of the governance studies program. Congratulations on your new book, Daryl. Well, Susan, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks to USA Today for allowing you to uh, join us. I'm looking forward to our conversation. And I do want to point out for those who are looking for a great book, they should <laughs> actually read Susan's book about Nancy Pelosi entitled Madam Speaker. It's a great read and uh, obviously very relevant for many current topics. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. And to our audience, we welcome your questions and your comments through this hour. Please send us on Twitter to the at BrookingsGov Twitter account with the hashtag PowerPolitics, one word, or send them by email to events at brookings.edu and we'll ask as many of them as we can. Now, Daryl, we talked about your professional resume, uh, your academic and think tank experience. I'd like to talk about a different uh, time of your uh, experience in life, which is growing up on a dairy farm in Ohio. And I wonder what you think, you talk about this in your book, why is that important, do you think, in trying to understand the phenomenon that has been Donald Trump? Well, one of the reasons I wrote this book about American democracy is because we are in crisis right now, and we see widespread polarization, extremism, and radicalization. But I think one of the distinctive aspects of my background is I've lived among both conservative and liberal tribes. So as you point out, I grew up in rural Ohio. I uh, grew up on a dairy farm, used to milk cows before I uh, went to a school. Uh, many of my family members are there and many of my high school classmates are very conservative. Uh, they like Donald Trump. Uh, so I grew up in that type of environment, but then taught political science for uh, 26 years at Brown University, which is a very liberal place. So I do think that my background uh, helps me gain some insights into both liberals and conservatives, uh, the populism that has enabled uh, Trump, uh, kind of some of the authoritarian, authoritarian sentiments that we're starting to see uh, from the general public. So where it's relevant, uh, I analyze the assault on American democracy, both from a national standpoint, but I also try and draw on my personal experiences to kind of bring the story to life and inform people about the perspectives of a lot of different people in the United States. Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Kansas, so also have a, a background in the heartland. And I'm, I'm, off, I'm often um, surprised and sometimes dismayed by attitudes of people who grew up on the coast or who've never lived any place but the east or west coast. What, what, what do you think they get? People who do not have the perspective of growing up on a farm um, or having family members who uh, are, are from the Midwest and have been drawn to Trump. What do they, do you think, what is, what is the perspective you can offer that maybe they just don't understand? Well, I know many of my former colleagues from Brown and current uh, colleagues at Brookings who have told me on various occasions, like, I don't know anybody who voted for Trump and how could anybody support that? And I like to remind them, like, I actually know hundreds of people who uh, voted for Trump. And so I think what that experience has given me is some understanding of what their complaints are, uh, what it is that has fueled Trumpism, uh, why we're seeing uh, populism and ultra-nationalism arise here in the United States and some of the challenges they pose. And then I also think it helps me on the solution side, because you have to be able to diagnose the situation accurately uh, in order to inform possible solutions. Uh, and I think there are structural problems that are uh, 
uh, that have enabled uh, Donald Trump. And if we want to get a handle on them, we're also going to need some pretty big reforms to address the concerns that the people who support him have. So just one more question about about your roots. Uh, In your book on page 25, you say uh, that most of your friends from high school believe that Antifa forces were responsible for the January 6th violence, feel liberals are traitorous hypocrites who no longer love the country. They feel that those living on the coast do not understand middle America and and want to move the country in a dangerous direction. So I'm wondering, what do they think of you? Uh, I'm sure they think a lot of different things. Uh, I actually had a great experience uh, this summer. I had my 50th high school reunion, Mm -hmm. which it's hard for me to uh, believe, but you know, I uh, saw many of my former uh, classmates. Uh, a number of them actually stayed in the rural area uh, where I uh, live, and it always strikes me. I've gone back uh, to Ohio at least uh, once a year for most of the decades uh, since I left. It, what strikes me is how difficult the lives have been, how rural America has been devastated. The American dream has completely fallen apart. People's children are doing a lot worse than they themselves uh, do. They understand that my life experiences since I left there has varied considerably from theirs. I mean, I've had amazing opportunities at Brown and then now at uh, Brookings. I think at one level, they like the fact that I came from the heartland uh, and they understand that that helps me understand them and their views and why they're so discontented with the status quo and why many of them actually were willing to turn to Donald Trump because they wanted to shake things up. They didn't like the status quo. Uh, They uh, haven't done very well in the status quo. Uh, But some of them also are probably suspicious that I've kind of gone over to the other side in some uh, respects that, you know, I basically lived on the East Coast for uh, several uh, decades now. But I have always found that I still have very good and open conversations uh, with many people from my hometown, uh, even if I disagree with their particular stance, either on Trump or uh, some of the risks facing our country right now. You know, good and open conversations. That has been hard, I think, for a lot of Americans on both sides to have good and open conversations with people uh, with whom they disagree. I mean, Trump is a real dividing line for a lot of Americans on on both sides. How can good and civil civil conversations happen in a country that is as polarized as ours is? Well, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Like, I mean, I've been studying American politics for 40 years now, and the polarization and the extremism that we're seeing today, I think, is unrivaled. Uh, It's very intense, uh, and it does make those types of conversations very difficult. But what I have found is, like, if you discuss these issues at an abstract level, people kind of quickly retreat to their corners They're suspicious of opponents. They think their opponents are enemies as opposed to just somebody who happens to have a different uh, point of view. What I have found is if you can kind of personalize the discussion, bring the issues down, I often have been surprised at some of the agreement that I find between liberal friends and conservative friends. So for example, the loss of economic opportunity in America, which it's not the only thing that's fueling Trumpism and populism, but is certainly a substantial a part of it. You know, income inequality is at a 100 year high in America right now. Uh, our tax policy had been tilted towards the wealthy and uh, rich uh, corporations. And as a result of that, the average person has not done very well, economic opportunity has suffered, and the American dream uh, has become almost uh, mythical for many people. When you discuss problems of economic opportunity, there are things both liberals and conservatives agree on. When you talk about threats to American democracy, there actually was a new survey that just came out of uh, Quinnipiac uh, uh, this week in which it found 69% of Democrats and 69% of Republicans think American democracy is in danger of collapse. So even though you're right, we live in a very polarized time period, there actually are some things that people agree on. And and a couple of those things are the threats to democracy and the loss of economic opportunity. How shocking is it that 69% of Americans uh, have that attitude about the perils facing democracy now. It's like the only issue on which there may be bipartisan agreement at this point. You know, the title of your second chapter is Why You Should Be Worried. Why You Should Be Worried. I don't actually know anyone who is not worried uh, at this moment, uh, but to, to argue 
the reverse. You know, politics has long been a contact sport in America. We've had big debates. We've had political violence and assassination. We had a civil war. We had uh, uh, conflicts over the civil rights movement, over the Iraq war and the Vietnam war. So should we be, why should we be especially worried? Is this, is this just one more chapter in the American experience that we'll look back on and see how we survived it? Or is this something that is different from what we've seen before? We should be especially worried about the current period because the rise of undemocratic elements, the rise of authoritarianism, the rise of populism, those things are not limited to the United States. They actually are global phenomena. It's actually shocking the number of countries that pretty recently had well-functioning democracies that have turned either illiberal and have started to dismantle democratic institutions within their own countries or turned outright authoritarian. And I would cite countries such as uh, Poland, uh, where the ruling party is rigging the elections in their own favor, changing the legal system to basically appoint uh, friendly uh, judges. Uh, Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, of course, is uh, a very prominent uh, advocate of what he calls illiberalism. You know, he has dismantled uh, parts of civil society that were critical of him, uh, basically forced the Central European University to relocate from Budapest to Austria. Uh, Turkey uh, was a functioning democracy just a few years ago and now uh, has moved authoritarian. Uh, and then uh, Brazil and the Philippines. So the fact that it's happening in many places around the world and the fact that there are democracies including allies of ours that used to be democratic, but now have turned authoritarian. This should worry Americans because I have encountered some people who basically say, look, our democracy is you know, over two centuries old. It can't happen here. Like we see it happening in a few other places, but America is strong. Our political institutions are strong. Our civil society is strong. Like we will overcome this particular moment. And I, by the way, I hope that uh, uh, all those people are right. Uh, but there are enough worrisome signs of how we've started already down that path to illiberalism that I think people should be worried. There are lots of warning signs out there that we need to take very seriously. I was, uh, I was shocked by January 6th. Were you shocked? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I was watching it on TV and I live just a couple of miles away from uh, the U.S. Capitol. So it was basically not that uh, far away. Uh, but what to me was even more shocking, like, you know, we have seen mob violence uh, in America on different occasions. What shocked me is the evening of that uh, protest and that insurrection, you know, once the members of Congress had reassembled, there still were a bunch of Republicans that were, you know, trying to reopen the debate, uh, challenge the legitimacy of Biden's uh, victory, and perhaps even nullify the actual election. Uh, that I find even more concerning than, you know, the insurrection that preceded that. And then in the year and a half since that time, my anxieties have even increased because, you know, when Congress wanted to investigate what happened on that day, Republicans basically did not want to cooperate uh, with the investigation, refused to join the panel. And then we spent the summer kind of hearing all these witnesses come forward. And the details are even more alarming uh, than I thought at the time. I mean, I basically finished my book last fall. And at the time, I did worry that I was being too pessimistic about the future of America. But after learning all uh, the details of some of those hearings over the last year, I actually wonder if I was too optimistic. Uh, yeah, you know, we've had a question from someone in our audience that relates to this I want to ask. And I just want to remind everyone that if you'd like to Submit a question. You can do it on Twitter to at BrookingsGov uh, with the hashtag PowerPolitics, or you can send them by to email to events at brookings.edu. This question comes from Martin Fleck from Physicians for Social Responsibility. And he says, did the January 6th events qualify as a coup attempt? Are Americans in denial about something that is obvious to non-Americans? Was that an attempted coup? I do believe it was an attempted coup on Trump's part, not necessarily on the part of all Republicans or even some of the Republicans who were questioning the legitimacy of the election. But uh, 
you know, the more we have learned about what happened on January 6th, and I think, you know, I have found the hearings of uh, the congressional hearings of the last few months to be very informative because almost all the witnesses were Republicans. Almost all of them were people who worked in the White House. Uh, they were people who Trump had appointed. And some of the stories they have told about uh, the violence taking place and then Trump basically not being willing uh, to allow the mayor to call in the National Guard or for the Department of Defense to call in uh, military troops to quell the violence. I mean, basically, he left those poor Capitol police officers out there by themselves to get their heads bashed in, uh, in very ugly ways. So uh, that is uh, very uh, shocking. Some of the details about the extent to which Trump went to try and get his own vice president, Mike Pence, to unilaterally overturn the popular vote uh, and the elected will of the American public, uh, that is very shocking. Uh, and I think Pence himself uh, seems to be pretty shocking based uh, uh, appears to be very shocked based on his own uh, reactions of uh, the last few months. So it's like there are a lot of details that have uh, come out that have suggested that this was kind of an amateurish attempt at a coup d'etat, but there was a clear effort to overturn uh, that election. And the thing that I worry about is Trump was not quite competent enough to pull it off, but he actually showed everybody else where the vulnerabilities are in our current election process, as well as in the vote counting process, in how elections get certified at the state level, who decides which electors to send to Congress, how Congress decides to accept the Democratic electors versus the Republican electors. Like we can all see those weaknesses. And my hope is the Congress will close at least some of those loopholes and deal with some of the vagueness that could allow uh, extra constitutional uh, efforts uh, in the future. But so far, Congress has not done that. That worries me a lot. Do you think we could have a similar event after the 2024 election? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there are states that have already passed uh, legislation basically allowing their state legislature to certify the election and or decide whether the Republican or Democratic slate of Electoral College voters gets sent to uh, Congress as opposed to the Secretary of State, which in most states, that has been a relatively nonpartisan type of uh, position. Uh, those legislatures have removed the power from Secretary of States, in some uh, cases governors, and given it to uh, themselves. That creates a lot of opportunity for mischief. Uh, the continuing concern about ballot security and the fact that uh, so many Republicans still believe uh, that the 2020 election was uh, stolen. You can imagine a situation in 2024 when all it will take is allegations of ballot fraud in a few key precincts, in a few key cities, in two or three key states, and that could lead to the overturning of the election. So we can all see the roadmap on how this can happen. And there's nothing that has happened over the last year or so that has reassured me that this can't happen again. Could, I wonder, could it have been even worse? I mean, I'm thinking uh, uh, Vice President Pence, no hero to Democrats prior to January 6th. He did stand up. He refused to do what Trump wanted him to do. He refused to leave the Capitol grounds for fear the Secret Service would refuse to bring him back. Um, could, could it have been much worse? Was it, was it, it could, only, are we just lucky that it happened, that it, that we recovered the way we did? Uh, we are lucky. Uh, and it actually could have been uh, much worse. And I do want to applaud a number of brave Republicans who basically took on a guy who remains very popular within uh, the Republican Party. And certainly uh, VP Pence uh, falls uh, in that category. Uh, there were leading senators at the time. I mean, Mitt Romney uh, certainly uh, comes to mind as people who have spoken out against this. Some of the members of the Congressional uh, Commission that is investigating uh, January 6th, certainly Liz Cheney gave the ultimate sacrifice of sacrificing her seat uh, in defense of uh, democracy, uh, Adam uh, Kinzinger. So there were a number of Republicans that actually stood up for truth telling. They understand uh, that this issue is actually bigger than the policy divide between liberals and conservatives, that the future of American democracy is on the line. But, you know, Trump still has a pretty strong hold on the Republican Party right now. And if 
one wants to look ahead to 2024, you know, it looks like either he's going to be the nominee or somebody who espouses the very same policy views is going to be the Republican nominee. So Trump's name is in the title. The title of your book, Power Politics, Trump and the Assault on American Democracy. And we've got several questions about Trump, which I want to get to in just a minute. But one of the central arguments of your book is that it's not all about Trump, that Trump didn't make this, that he fed it and he benefited from it. But you write about that about structural and systemic problems that created a perfect storm. What is this perfect storm? I mean, what I argue in my power politics book is that Trumpism is going to outlast Trump himself. So let's say hypothetically Trump tomorrow announces he's retiring from politics and is never going to make another public utterance, which of course is hard to believe. Uh, but if that happened, the threat to American democracy is still there because all the factors that propel Trumpism still are there. You know, the voting rights issues, income inequality, kind of the cultural divide that exists in America, the vagaries in the way we uh, conduct our elections and actually uh, count uh, the votes. Uh, I have a section in the book where I talk about one thing people don't realize is there are lots of presidential emergency power bills that already are on the books. They've been passed by Congress over the last few years. Everybody assumed a benevolent president and a responsible president, but we can imagine if there's an irresponsible or authoritarian president uh, who could possibly abuse those emergency power uh, declarations. So there's a lot uh, that is going to propel Trumpism well into the future, certainly in 2022 and 2024 and perhaps uh, beyond. And the thing I worry about is there are a number of leading Republicans who are now basically mimicking uh, Trump. So they understand that, you know, if Trump gets indicted or doesn't run or, you know, for whatever reason uh, is not on the ballot in 2024, they're going to step up. But they seem to be interested in running a very similar type of campaign. And from a public opinion standpoint, they actually could do very well. You know, a lot of your book talks about what to do. It's not just here's a prescription of all that went wrong, but here are some solutions about what to do. So I know this is a big and complicated area, but we're getting a lot of questions of people asking for concrete steps about what they can do. Let me just read two questions. One is from uh, Samantha Sloan on Twitter. Samantha writes, what can the U.S. and its inhabitants do to re reinvigorate democracy, particularly in light of vocal U.S. residents and elected representatives who ignore or deny threats to the U.S. liberal order. And here's a e question by email from Lisa Hudson. She writes, as Americans, how do we combat this global trend toward populism and the rising threat of the far right to our democracy specifically? So what can people do? I mean, the way we can fight these trends towards populism and ultranationalism is one, understand their bases, and then two, undertake specific and very concrete steps that address the underlying grievances. I mean, part of the reason I wrote the book is one, I think people focus too much on Trump. And it's not like I don't share their concern about him, but it's the threats actually are much uh, bigger uh, than him. And so in the book, I are, I'm very much focused on possible remedies and possible solutions, because those uh, uh, listeners and uh, watchers are right. You know, we're in a very unusual moment. We can't just sit around complaining about the threats. Like we need to think specifically uh, what we need to do. So here are just a few uh, items and I'm happy to talk about any of uh, these in greater detail. So one big uh, problem right now uh, clearly is in the area of uh, voting rights. And one of the things I like to remind people of is a big success story from the 2020 election. And that was the very high level of voter turnout that we had. I think we had 66.8% of Americans, uh, eligible Americans uh, turned out to vote. That is a two thirds voter turnout. That is one of the highest voter turnouts in a presidential election we have seen in decades in the United States. And I applaud the fact that liberals, moderates, conservatives, libertarians, and people who have even more extreme views turned out to vote. This is what democracy is all about. The thing that helped us reach that high level of voter turnout was early voting and uh, mail uh, ballots. Uh, and so in terms of voting rights reforms, uh, 
people like early voting because they don't want to just wait until election day. And, you know, sometimes they're working that day and it creates uh, problems. Uh, they like uh, mail ballots. Uh, when we made it easy for people to vote, people voted. This is important to democracy and we should encourage that. And by the way, there are a number of states that have actually moved in the opposite direction over the last year. Income inequality is a huge driver of populism. And again, I can draw on my experiences growing up in rural Ohio. Income inequality is at a 100 year high in America. You literally have to go back almost to, 19, to the 1920s and 1930s to find similar levels of high income inequality. The big culprit here is public policy, our tax policies and our social policies, which have conferred lots of benefits on super, super, super wealthy individuals and rich uh, corporations. There are corporations that are paying only a 5 to 10% tax rate. This is completely unfair. Uh, Susan, I'm pretty sure both you and I pay a much higher tax rate than 5 or 10%, and many of the people watching uh, this uh, webinar are paying a much uh, higher uh, level. So we need to have tax policies that uh, address uh, income inequality because the loss of economic opportunity, uh, the loss of the American dream drives populism, it drives Trumpism, and it makes people feel really unhappy with the status quo and willing to entertain unconventional or even un uh, democratic uh, things. Uh, the last point I'll make uh, is just the cultural aspect of the threats to democracy. There's a big debate going on in America about what it means to be an American. And Trump certainly made immigration one of the key cleavage points in that debate and kind of clearly distinguished us versus them, us being Americans and native born Americans and immigrants who are you know, crossing uh, the river from uh, Mexico. And I like to remind people, we should actually have a more favorable view about immigration in America, because what one of the things that actually has made America great over the last century has been immigration and the melting pot and the fact that we had people from all around the world who came to America and uh, created uh, businesses and helped to drive our economy. Even in the technology area, People don't recognize that half of the Silicon Valley companies had an immigrant founder or co-founder. So the one area in which America actually does excel now is in technology innovation. Immigration is a key part of that story. So I know that people in the cultural area have like all these views about immigration and minorities and the role of women in American life uh, these days. We need to think about what are the things that did make America great and kind of have policies that, uh, that support the things that actually have driven both innovation and economic prosperity in the United States. Here's, here's a sort of related uh, question from Daphne Spreitzer, from who is a Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army. Uh, and thank you for your service there. Uh, here's her question. Do you think moving to a national popular vote for president would solve some of the distrust in the electoral system? Do you think ranked choice voting for congressional seats would help solve our flawed primary system? Let me just add one more thing to her list and that is open primaries. Uh, because we've seen, let, maybe we should start with ranked choice voting because we see the way ranked choice voting made a difference in, in his, you know historic election in Alaska last night. What do you think of ranked choice voting? Well, my short answer is yes, yes, yes to each of those uh, questions. So we do uh, need to support open primaries because it's a way to encourage moderates on both sides. It's a way to discourage and penalize extremists from both sides, extreme liberals as well as extreme conservatives. Uh, the same is true in terms of ranked choice of voting. Actually, just yesterday, we saw Alaska have a special congressional election where Sarah Palin, Kames, a former VP candidate, lost a congressional election that Republicans expected to win because uh, uh, Alaska is a pretty uh, conservative state. She lost it in part uh, because of ranked choice voting uh, was uh, used there. And again, more moderate uh, candidates ended up uh, doing well. We saw the same thing in the New York City uh, uh, election uh, where Eric Adams, uh, who is a fairly moderate uh, Democrat, 
was able to win over a number of more progressive uh, Democrats uh, running in that state. And of course, New York City is an incredibly liberal place uh, to begin with. And I think a lot of people uh, thought a very liberal uh, mayor would end up uh, being elected there. So these types of election reforms actually are critical to getting a handle on the polarization, the extremism, and the radicalization. And the last thing I want to point out is just a short history lesson. Reforming our election process is as American as apple pie. You know, we've done it regularly throughout our 200 plus year history. Uh, for example, in the early 20th century, there were major forces in American society that were upset about a dysfunctional national government, uh, corruption in high places. And by the way, there, the corruption was like cash in suitcases. So it was really a blatant uh, kinds of corruption. And so they develop presidential primaries. They develop public referendums to give uh, the public a chance to weigh in on policy issues. Like when you look historically, we have always had problems money in politics and undue uh, influence by special interest groups and too much power uh, by the business community, we have adopted political and election reforms designed to address those things. We need to do the same thing today. We have big problems and it may take big solutions to address those issues. You know, you said yes to the, the suggestion of a national popular vote for president, but would that not just guarantee that candidates only pay attention to the biggest and most popular states and that states like Kansas or Rhode Island would be ignored? Okay, Susan, now you're making me betray my former home state of uh, Rhode Island. And you're absolutely right, like smaller states would be disadvantaged. But my view on this topic actually has changed over time because I used to teach a campaigns and elections uh, course at Brown and for years, I would extol the virtues of the Electoral College, bemoan the risk of uh, direct uh, popular uh, voting on uh, uh, presidential elections. But a few years ago, as I started to see some of the trends that we've been talking about emerge in American politics, I actually changed my view. And in 2019, actually wrote a paper that is on the Brookings website at brookings.edu entitled, Why It's Time to Get Rid of the Electoral College. I do think that is a big political reform that it's absolutely mandatory that we need to do. Now, I know people are going to say, oh, God, the Electoral College, like we're never going to get rid of it. It takes a constitutional amendment, blah, blah, blah. What I like to tell people is not <laughs> to basically take a stance of political status quoism. Basically, a big mistake that I think people are making today is to think, Whatever our politics are today, it's going to be the same five years from now and 10 years from now. And what I like to remind people is we're going to see two really big trends unfold over the next decade. Demographic change, where America is becoming more minority. And if you add up the number of African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, they are moving to majority status uh, in about uh, 20 years from now. And secondly, generational change. When you look at public opinion surveys, younger people are more liberal than senior citizens. Uh, they're more worried about climate change and more willing to take decisive action. They feel the loss of economic opportunity because that's the story of their lives and the story of their uh, generation. So things that might seem impossible today policy-wise are not going to be impossible uh, 10 years from now. Like in 1896, America was completely agitated by the gold standard. Nobody cares about the gold standard anymore. The issues that drive American politics, the issues that motivate people change enormously from decade to decade. And so big political reforms that may seem impossible now are not going to be impossible 10 or 15 years from now. Yeah. Lessons from Bernie Sanders on some of that. Uh, point, you know, sit, believe what you believe and take over the long haul, who knows what you can do. You know, we've gotten a couple questions that relate to something that we talked about earlier in this hour. Uh, here's an email from John Goodman. He writes, you highlight that 69% of Republicans and Democrats agree that there are threats to democracy. Do they see the dangers in the same place? And let me just go back to another question that was to the same point. Let's see if I can find it. Yes, this is from Carol Sang. Do Republicans and Democrats agree on what the threats to our democracy are, on who the threat is from and how, that is voter fraud and fake ballots versus Republican gerrymandering and le legislatures countermanding votes? 
Because if we disagree on what the threats are, isn't that even more reason for concern? What would you say? Uh, yeah, both of those are great questions and they're both right on target uh, in the sense that that bipartisan agreement on the fact that they, people think that American democracy is in danger of collapse does mask a very different diagnosis of what the problem is and also what the solutions are. And of course, that is what polarization uh, today is all about. So uh, you're right that uh, Republicans and Democrats and liberal and conservatives can see similar trends. They see the high income inequality. They see the loss of economic opportunity. They see the cultural uh, uh, divisions that are uh, animating uh, people these days, but they reach very different conclusions on what we uh, need to do. But what we need to do is on all of these questions, there are certainly big uh, issue divides uh, separating Republicans and Democrats, but we need an election system that basically empowers moderation on both sides, as opposed to what our current situation, which is extremism on both sides. And take the case of, of primaries, you know, whether it's a presidential primary or a congressional primary, that, you know, if you have a crowded field of Republicans uh, running for the GOP nomination or a crowded field of Democrats, and you have low voter turnout, and in off-year congressional elections, we often have voter turnout that's 35% or even less. Uh, basically, only a third of Americans typically vote in congressional uh, midterm elections. When you have low voter turnout during a period of polarization, all the candidates want to play to the base. Like Democratic candidates are playing to progressive elements. Republican candidates are playing to uh, conservative populist or ultra nationalist elements because they know people who feel intensely are, the one, are going to be among that one third uh, that does uh, turn out to vote. So this is where the structural reforms come in. Like you can have a country that is very divided on economics, on culture, on foreign policy, and a range of other issues. But if we have political institutions that discourage extremism and encourage moderation, we can deal with those issues. And in fact, historically, that has been how America's handled polarization, that our political system kind of rubs off the sharp edges and basically forces or encourages people to compromise and negotiate with the other side. That's where some of our best policies have come in the past. We need to get back to that type of mentality. Now, I mean, <clears throat> at a kind of discouraging time, there are a couple of things that have, that have been uh, uh, good. Open primaries, the only two Republicans who voted to impeach, House Republicans who voted to impeach Trump, who have survived to the general election this time, both got there because their states had open primaries. So they weren't uh, held hostage to the most extreme voices in their own parties. We've seen ranked choice voting, as you as you discussed before, in both New York City and Alaska having a real effect. You see, um, states adopting uh, usually often because their voters have demanded it, less gerrymandered congressional districts. I think that's also been an encouraging thing. And you mentioned the 2020 election. I mean, the fact not only that we had record turnout, but we had record turnout. A, a fair and free and fair election during a pandemic that no one who was running an election had ever dealt with before. These are things I think uh, that are that are a little heartening in a time when maybe we should, we are searching for for silver linings. We've got. Yeah, if I could just jump in on that point, I think that's a very important point because it is very easy to feel discouraged and even pessimistic about America and the future of our democracy, just given all the things that are happening now. But you're absolutely right that there are some success stories. Uh, there's bipartisan legislation uh, that has uh, uh, passed uh, Congress. Uh, there have been major uh, issues uh, that have been addressed. Uh, there's innovation taking place at the state and local level that is moving America in the right direction. So I like to tell people I'm kind of a short-term pessimist right now, but a long-term optimist. Like I think if somehow we can get through the next 10 years, which I admit are gonna be rocky, chaotic, and perhaps even violent. It's going to be, uh, it's going to challenge all of us. If somehow we can get through the next 10 years, I'm actually very optimistic about the future of America and the future of American democracy. Uh, do we have, we have a question here from David Penske from Trim Tab Ventures who asks, what happens after Trump? 
there will be an after Trump. What happens then? Well, I'm not too reassured by what happens in the short run after Trump, just because Trumpism is still going to be there, even if he individually is not there. So all the things we're talking about still are going to be there. There are what I call in the book Republican copycat candidates who are basically doing the same thing and uh, addressing the same uh, issues uh, as uh, Trump did. So uh, if Trump disappeared, it's not going to save American democracy. And that's the reason in the book I try and focus on systemic and structural factors, because I think there are too many people who blame all of the threats on American democracy on Trump himself. And they're not understanding that there are these forces that have made Trump possible that are still going to be there even after he leaves the scene. So it's the reason why in the book I try and think about reforms that address grievances, because it's the grievances that are dividing America right now and the grievances that are fueling the populism and the ultra nationalism. You know, here's a related question from Charles Lepresti from PNNL, who writes, how long can we expect movements like Trumpism to persist? So that goes to the point, not Trump, but Trumpism. What's the likely lifespan of Trumpism? Well, there's a long history of social movements in America, and they've often been quite influential in shaping our politics as well as our society. You know, the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, the environmental movement. I would say when you look at a kind of past of movements, I would say the life cycle of many of these movements is two or three decades in the sense that it takes a while to organize and then it takes a while for those people who are concerned about those types of issues to uh, gain political influence. And then ultimately they gain political power. They're able to get uh, new policies enacted into law and then they focus on implementation. And then as we have made progress addressing the environment, like the Environmental Protection Act of 1970, then the movement starts to recede because the grievances that fueled those movements have gotten addressed. I think there's a valuable lesson for the, con for the contemporary period and Trumpism in particular, that for me, when I look historically, it tells me we have to address the grievances. Like we can't just assume that all Trump voters are crazy people. Because if you assume that, it delegitimizes what are some legitimate grievances on their part. And if we don't take the grievances seriously, and if we're not able to make progress on income inequality and the loss of economic opportunity, Trumpism could endure for much longer and become even more threatening and actually usher in uh, an authoritarian time period in America. So we need to uh, take these uh, long-term factors seriously and take steps to address them. And one of the problems is some people who are against Trump think people who follow Trump are crazy. They can't understand how they could possibly do that. And some people who follow Trump thinks those who are against him are, are traitors, uh, do not have America's interests at heart. During the 2016 campaign, Hillary Clinton described some Trump supporters as the deplorables. And we heard President Biden just last week say that some in the GOP were semi-fascist. And I wonder if you what you think of that sort of rhetoric. Well, I didn't like Hillary Clinton's use of the word deplorables in regard to the people that I grew up with, because they are not deplorable. They are people who uh, work very hard. They're responsible Americans. They're law abiding people. Uh, but they haven't done very well for the last uh, 40 years. And, and I understand why uh, they are upset. When Biden talked about, it was kind of an interesting way he phrased it. He didn't accuse Republicans of being fascist. He said they were semi-fascist. You know, I don't actually know what a semi-fascist is. It's like you're fascist or you're not a fascist. Like I don't get that intermediate category uh, that he used. It was like he was trying to use a soft version of, hey, you guys are turning uh, authoritarian or autocratic. Uh, I actually think there's more evidence to support that criticism uh, than uh, the one that Hillary Clinton uh, used. Uh, because, uh, and I would certainly not label all Republicans with that kind of uh, language and that type of critique, but there do appear to be significant and powerful forces within the Republican Party uh, that are moving towards autocracy, uh, that are willing to embrace undemocratic means in order to hold power. It's no accident I entitled my book, Power Politics, 
uh, because I argue we are in a period of power politics where if you have power, you use it. That legal rights, civil rights, human rights just don't matter uh, as much anymore. It's raw political power. And by the way, that's true in the United States. It's also true around the world. And Vladimir Putin is certainly demonstrating uh, that in uh, Russia. Uh, and so I, I have a chapter in my book on public opinion, and I actually uh, present a, a data analysis from those surveys at the rise of authoritarian sentiments among the American electorate. And I was actually shocked at what I found. I mean, there are different surveys and they have slightly different results, but there are up to a third of Americans who are willing to embrace attitudes and or behaviors that are authoritarian in nature, uh, meaning being willing to overturn the popular vote if you think there is ballot fraud, even if you can't prove there is a ballot fraud, uh, being willing to override uh, judges uh, who consider ballot fraud cases, uh, even though you know there were dozens of court cases after the 2020 election on the alleged uh, ballot fraud, and in virtually every one of those cases, including cases decided by judges appointed by Donald Trump, Trump lost the case. So there wasn't uh, much evidence there. But from a public opinion standpoint, Trump has been very effective at poisoning our discourse and convincing so many people that the 2020 election was stolen. And if people think that, if they think the other side would resort to those types of illegal and unfair tactics, it then allows them to rationalize, well, if the other side is acting in an undemocratic way, then I can do the same thing. That is a very uh, dangerous uh, 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 public opinion uh, development in the United States. And so when I saw some of the survey results on that, it, one, it completely shocked me, and two, it completely worried me. Daryl, uh, uh, yeah, as, you, as you know from having done so very many books, uh, there are always things that surprise you when you're researching a book, things that you didn't understand or didn't realize. What, what, was, when, what was the most surprising thing for you in thinking about this book and writing it? I mean, I think the most surprising thing was how all these factors have become what you described earlier as the perfect storm. Like if there was just one kind of vaguely anti-democratic element taking place in American society, I actually wouldn't worry too much about that because, as you have mentioned, there have been other times in American history where we've had radical social movements, ex extremism, uh, anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, uh, racism, uh, and other uh, such things. And we have managed to overcome it. Sometimes it took a lot of effort, but uh, we uh, did make some progress on doing that. What surprised me about the current period, when I actually got systematic and just started looking at the variety of things, is how so many of these problems are actually interrelated and they feed onto one another in ways that are very uh, dangerous. Uh, and so, the high income inequality, uh, the rolling back of voting rights, the cultural divide uh, that uh, Republicans have actually played to very great uh, political effect, the structural political elements in terms of having an electoral college uh, that uh, kind of ends up uh, undercutting the popular vote. One of the statistics that I discovered in the course of uh, research for the book that I'd never seen before and it did completely shock me, was Republicans have won the presidential popular vote only once between 1992 and 2020. That happened to be the 2004 election when uh, George W. Bush beat uh, John Kerry in the popular vote. In every other election, either Democrats have won the popular vote and then won the Electoral College and become president, or Democrats have won the popular vote, lost the Electoral College, and the Republicans won. And so Republicans actually are doing really poorly politically in terms of public opinion, like they've lost most of the presidential elections at the popular vote level. But obviously, because of the Electoral College, I think they've controlled the presidency at least 40 percent of the time over the last 30 years. That has allowed them to dominate policymaking because the Senate has uh you need 60 votes out of 100 in uh, the Senate in order to pass legislation because of the power of the filibuster that gives Republicans either greater uh, influence. It's allowed them to now get a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court, and that court is rolling back uh, protections that Americans used to think. So 
this is the thing that both surprised and shocked me, how all of these elements are intertwined. It's the perfect storm that is problematic because as we all know from hurricane season, when you have the perfect storm, the damage is widespread. Yeah, and, and new technology too uh, is something that you've written about in this book and in others as, as a factor in uh, changing the way people communicate, changing the way you can organize, changing the, the sense of people have about whether they have control over things. Uh, that's That would be one more element. So we, we talked about some of the encouraging things that have happened uh, on elections, but here's a, here's a question from Thomas Horton, who is a policy advisor in the Michigan House of Representatives. And he writes, given the deepening, <coughs> excuse me, given the deepening political divides of our time, which is more likely reconciliation and bipartisanship or deterioration to a second American civil war? Is talk of the civil war hyperbolic or do you think that is something we ought to be worrying about? Uh, actually, I don't think either one of those scenarios are the most uh, likely ones. Uh, I've actually written about uh, both of them. Brookings had a project on reconciliation a couple of years ago, and you know, we kind of talked about ways that we could uh, reconcile with one another. That is probably not a uh, high probability event, at least in the next uh, few years. Uh, polarization is still going to be the dominant political threat. But I also don't believe we're headed for a civil war. Uh, Bill Gale of our economic studies program and I actually wrote a piece on this uh, six months ago of is the United States headed towards a, a civil war. Uh, the thing that shocked me is we've had uh, almost a quarter million page views of that one piece alone in the six months that we wrote it. And I view that as a very negative indicator about our future. But despite that, I don't think we're headed for a civil war because if you compare the current situation with the 1860s, what made that civil war possible was the geographic basis of the conflict. You know, it was the North versus the South, the pro-slavery states versus the uh, uh, pro-freedom uh, states. Like it was a very clear uh, distribution. Today, we have conflicts basically between rural and urban areas in each of the 50 states. Like Lincoln, Nebraska is much more liberal than the state of Nebraska. Austin, Texas is much more liberal than the state of Texas. And so from my standpoint, I think it's hard to have a civil war unless you're gonna have civil wars in each of the 50 states that basically pit the cities versus uh, suburban and uh, rural areas. I just don't see that as a likelihood. But the scenario that I think is actually more realistic, uh, but also quite worrisome, is just the rise of violence in America. Uh, and the violence can, can basically be one-off violence where somebody basically shoots somebody for uh, political reasons. And we certainly have seen a number of examples of that to a January 6th style insurrection where a bunch of people come together, they plan uh, an attack and they ac actually execute it. Only there, we shouldn't just assume that the object of that attack is going to be the US Capitol. I mean, they chose that on January 6th because they wanted to stop the election certification that was going to take place uh, on Capitol Hill on that particular day. But you can imagine situations in the future where local courthouses get attacked, state capitol buildings get attacked, state and or federal administrative agencies and offices uh, get uh, attacked. Like there are a variety of attacks that could uh, take place. And I hope the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are taking these types of domestic threats seriously because there's so much anger out there and so many guns. This is actually the scenario that I worry about because I think it's more realistic and more plausible than either outright reconciliation and we all live happily together or an outright civil war. Yeah. Here's an email from Aline, Aline Seckler, uh, who writes, my sense is that democracy worldwide needs success worldwide, uh, i.e. it means much more boldness, creativity, communication, and understanding from the leaderships democratically elected. What could be such a major success in the U.S. or beyond its borders? And to, to repose that question, what is there a place that is like a model of dealing with that you mentioned that this this in some ways a worldwide phenomenon we're seeing uh, what we see in the united states happening in other democracies as well is there a place that is handling this these challenges 
particularly well? I mean, you're certainly right. There are uh, many uh, challenges all around the world and uh, kind of the forces that we're seeing here, uh, we're also seeing in a lot of other uh, places. Uh, the places that I actually think are handling it better are mostly European countries, not Eastern European, but uh, Western European uh, countries, in the sense that they have found a sweet spot in the sense of clinical institutions that are more broadly representative and encourage moderation as opposed to extremism. And in some places, you know, it's a parliamentary system uh, that encourages that. Uh, and maybe there are multiple parties in some of these uh, countries. So there often is not a dominant single uh, political party, but even a more extreme party has to compromise and form coalitions with more moderate parties in order to actually achieve a governing majority. Uh, some of these countries also, I think, have done a better job on the income inequality issue. And again, I emphasize that just because of its link to uh, populism, that they actually have lower levels of income inequality than we do because they have fairer uh, tax uh, policies. So there are success stories around the world. Uh, we need to uh, look at some of those uh, uh, places. Not all of their lessons are applicable for the United States because we have a different history and different culture and kind of uh, differing uh, political expectations. But uh, uh, I think uh, the, the person is, is right that uh, democracies need to do a better job. And the key thing is they have to perform better. It's poor performance, in my view, that is driving some of these public opinion uh, trends towards uh, populism and authoritarianism. Poor performance and not addressing the problems people see in their lives. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So mid, we're just 60 some days away from the midterms. What are you watching for? Uh, voter turnout. Uh, I want to see as high a voter turnout as possible. And that means across the political spectrum. You know, I want the Trump people to turn out to vote. I want the Bernie people to turn out to vote. I want the moderate elements to turn out to vote. Like the bigger the turnout, the more likely our political system is going to elect moderates, the less likely we are going to elect, elect extremists. And the problem is historically only about a third of Americans vote in uh, congressional midterm elections. And if that trend continues, we're likely to see many more extremists in the halls of Congress. So we're almost at the end of our hour. Uh, uh, it's been a really interesting conversation. So I have a lightning round of questions to ask you. In the next Congress, which party controls the Senate? I am much more optimistic about Democrats right now. So given some of the poor qualities of the Republican nominees, so I would say Democrats. You know, it could be the second time Donald Trump has cost Republicans a majority in the Senate because two years ago, his meddling in, in Georgia helped Democrats get to that 50 point. In the next Congress, which party controls the House? Republicans. That seems very clear, just gerrymandering and inflation and uh, uh, COVID. If Republicans control the House, is Kevin McCarthy speaker? I think he probably is, but obviously the margin varies a lot. He's less likely to be the speaker if he has a margin of 10 votes or less. If he has 10 more Republicans or more, his prospects go up. If, if I'm sorry, how close does it have to be for him to really be in, in danger, do you think? If, he, if Republicans have uh, a seat margin in the House of 10 votes or less. He, he could be in trouble. Yes, absolutely. Because that would empower the extreme elements within his own party. And if not McCarthy, who? If they've got a seven seat majority, who's the speaker? I think that probably will not be McCarthy, but I actually would not predict who that would be. Yeah, it's, that, that is a hard one. Uh, in the new Congress, will Nancy Pelosi be leading the Democrats? Uh, no. Uh, since I think Democrats are likely to lose their majority status, I think she will exit at that stage and probably retire uh, politically. And uh, if she hasn't read your book by then, uh, she will have <laughs> time to actually read it. <laughs> and finally, you know, it's silly to make predictions about a presidential election two years out. Let me just ask you this one. Will 2024 be a Biden versus Trump rematch? If the election were tomorrow, yes, I believe that would be the case. But the longer Obviously, we're more than two years away from that. The longer it goes on, 
there are more things that can go wrong for Trump, such as Republicans not winning the Senate when they should win it uh, this year. That would be a big negative for Trump within the Republican Party. Or obviously, if Trump gets indicted, uh, that becomes a big negative, too. Yeah, being indicted would be a big uh, problem. Just uh, that wasn't going to be my last question. But do you think Trump will face a, an indictment? I think on the national security stuff and all the classified documents that uh, he and or his staff uh, took to Mar-a-Lago, he has major legal vulnerability. If you or I had done that, we would be indicted. Yeah. Darrell West, thank you so much for this hour. And thank you for your new book, Power Politics, Trump and the Assault on American Democracy. Thanks so much for to Brookings. And thanks for everyone who joined us this hour for this conversation. Susan, thank you very much.